Hello and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Jack Derwin and I'm Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. Today we're very excited to host a panel discussion titled Biden's Antitrust Agenda, Mission Creep or Mission Achieved? Joining us today is a stellar panel of antitrust experts. In the interest of time, I'll keep these intros very brief, but you can view their full bios at fedsoc.org. Elise Dorsey is a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Kirkland and Ellis LLP. Previously, Elise served as counsel to the Assistant Attorney General in the U.S. Department of Justice's Antitrust Division and as attorney advisor to FDC Commissioner Noah Phillips. Amanda Lewis is a partner at Cuneo Gilbert and DeLuca LLP and has held a number of roles in the FDC's Bureau of Competition, including counsel detailee to the Antitrust Subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee. David J. Shaw is a partner in Morrison and Forster's Global Antitrust Law Practice Group. Before joining his firm, David was the Deputy Chief of Staff and Counsel to the Assistant Attorney General in, a, in the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice. And our moderator today, Jonathan Wolfson, is the Chief Legal Officer and Policy Director at the Cicero Institute. Before joining Cicero, Jonathan led the Policy Office at the U U.S. Department of Labor, among other roles. After discussion between our panelists, we'll go to audience Q&A. So please enter any questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. And finally, I'll note that as always, all expressions of opinion on today's program are those of the speakers joining us. With that, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jack, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited to get to moderate this panel with three really um, knowledgeable experts on these topics, and we're gonna have an interesting discussion. I'm not going to take very much time other than to give you a quick run of show that we're going to have each of the speakers talk for a few minutes about kind of an overview of what they see as some of the key issues in the Biden administration's decisions so far in the antitrust space. We will then follow that with some specific questions to each of the panelists. And at the end, we'll have some time for Q&A. And as Jack said, please put those in the Q&A tab in Zoom, and we will try to get to as many of those as we can at the end. So with that, I will turn it over to David Shaw to make some introductory remarks. Well, thanks, Jonathan and, uh, and, and Jack, and um, good afternoon. Happy to be on this panel. You know, I've known Jonathan for almost 25 years. I have the privilege of working with Elise at DOJ, and I've enjoyed getting to know Amanda kind of over the course of preparing for this. And so for my introductory remarks, I'm going to sort of give an overview of the DOJ antitrust division in the Biden administration. And I'll address some of the rhetoric, the policy, and the civil and criminal enforcement we've seen so far. But let me start with just giving a bottom line assessment, which is we're still pretty early into the Biden administration's impact on uh, the antitrust division. Uh, but the signal certainly suggests that we're on the cusp of some significant change. So we are early days. Biden may have taken office 18 months ago, but um, he only appointed and had his head of the interest division, Jonathan Cantor, confirmed as the Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust in November of 2021. Um, and moreover, Cantor was the first political appointee to show up in the antitrust division. Um, before that, uh, it was run by, by career officials. You know, in contrast, while it took some time for the Trump administration, uh, kind of confirmed head of the antitrust division to show up, his principal deputy was in place by spring of 2017. Um, and it's also taken some time for um, the full leadership team to get into place at the antitrust division. In fact, only this week did the final member of that team, Susan Athey, the um, economist and the, the come join as the, as the deputy assistant attorney general for, for economics. So I think the result is we haven't seen the full impact of uh, sort of Biden administration political appointees and, and AAG Cantor's leadership uh, specifically. And interest cases tend to move slowly. And so we really haven't seen the full life cycle of a significant case under his leadership. Now, on the rhetorical front, Cantor has come out swinging. He's criticized the consumer welfare standard. Uh, he has criticized the practice of settling merger cases, not simply behavioral remedies, which are which are almost universally derided, um, but, but even structural remedies. And he's impeded, repeatedly employed muscular rhetoric um, about not being afraid to bring difficult cases and the importance of litigating as opposed to settling cases. Um, in terms of policy, we have seen some movement on the policy front. The most significant is likely gonna be the rewriting of the merger guidelines in conjunction with the FTC. We haven't seen the new guidelines yet, 
But if the call for comments is indicative, I would expect a, a pretty dramatic change. And, and I hope we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about merger guidelines later in this, uh, in this panel. In terms of civil non-merger enforcement, there are public reports that um, Cantor is recused from the DOJ's most significant conduct case, which was brought by the last administration and is scheduled to go to trial in September of 2023. Um, and we haven't seen any additional Section 2 cases brought yet. Um, but this clearly, based on his speeches, seems to be a priority for um, Cantor. And I would be surprised if we didn't see at least one and maybe several before, um, before the end of his tenure. In terms of civil merger enforcement, DOJ has been very active in bringing merger challenges. Some of these decisions were made by career officials before Cantor was confirmed. Um, some of the cases have been pretty aggressive. Um, none strike me, although I'd be curious to hear Elise and Amanda's views on this, as unique to the Biden administration. The previous administration um, brought some pretty aggressive merger enforcement cases as well. And while I certainly wouldn't say that the same cases would have necessarily been brought by the administration, nothing strikes me as an outlier that a previous administration wouldn't have, could not have brought, um, at least for, for the DOJ. Uh, on criminal enforcement, we have seen sort of some very aggressive actions, um, particularly in the labor uh, space with, uh, with prosecutions for, for alleged uh, no poach agreements and, and wage fixing. Um, again, though, this is a continuation of, uh, of indictments that were brought in the previous administration. Um, you know, I think the criminal enforcement does give us an example um, that Jonathan Cantor is true to his word. He says he's not afraid to bring difficult cases. Um, and, and perhaps the most significant is the, um, kind of the chickens prosecution where there was a uh, Two mistrials and, and Cantor proceeded with a third trial, which was which was highly unusual, if not unprecedented. Um, that actually just came out with an acquittal yesterday, so we're um, so we're still you know we'll, we'll still see whether kind of we're going to get some some traction on that. I'd say the one thing on the criminal side that would represent an enormous departure, um, and we've seen rhetoric about it, um, but we haven't yet seen any indictments, is uh, is a section two criminal case. Um, DOJ has repeatedly said under Cantor that it would consider bringing this case. It hasn't given a lot of guidance as to what the exact facts would be um, around that. And there hasn't been a Section 2 criminal prosecution sort of in the modern era of, of antitrust enforcement. So if, if such prosecution were brought, um, then that would be a very significant uh, departure. It'd be a very interesting case to watch, unless I suppose you were the, the subject of it. Um, and, um, and, you know, we'll, we'll see. So I, I think significant changes on the horizon, um, but still, still um, yet to kind of fully come to fruition. Thanks, David. I mean, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in the world as it has been in the Biden administration. Sure. So, um, the, you know, the perspective that, that I bring here is, is certainly that I was at the FTC for um, about a decade um, under, under both Republican and Democratic administrations. Um, but most recently, the last three years um, that I was at the FTC, I was on detail to Congress. Um, so I'm going to sort of give the backdrop of what has been going on in Congress during the Biden administration, understanding that separation of powers, we are, um, you know, there's certainly been a lot of coordination um, and uh, the Biden administration has weighed in um, mostly in favor <laughs> of, uh, of things that the democratically controlled Congress has, uh, has done on antitrust, um, some of which was, was also on a bipartisan basis or most of which, um, so, uh, so with that, I will um, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about what's been going on in Congress, where uh, antitrust has had a much more prominent role than uh, than it has in the past. Um, in the, typically, the antitrust subcommittee, um, certainly on the on, I think on both sides, has been a, a pretty sleepy committee, um, but not so <laughs> while I was there. Um, and, uh, so, so I would say first, um, 
there are kind of four categories or four issue areas that Congress has been focused on when it comes to antitrust. And so that are uh, those are digital markets, supply chain, healthcare, and agriculture. Um, there's also, uh, I would say, labor competition issues as well. So we'll make that five. Uh, I think the the most sort of prominent uh, area has been in, in digital markets, um, but all of these areas were highlighted as priorities in President Biden's July 2021 executive order. So in that executive order, uh, the president uh, it had a pretty extensive uh, order and all geared towards promoting competition in the American economy. Uh, but all of these areas were featured prominently. So the digital markets investigation was initiated during the, the Trump administration, and that was a 16-month bipartisan investigation uh, focused on Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Apple. And uh, based on the findings of the investigation, after Biden took office, a group of Judiciary Committee members introduced several bipartisan bills, all of which were aimed at reigning in the, the monopoly power of the, the largest online platforms and also revitalizing competition in digital markets. So um, the Senate Judiciary Committee has advanced the companions of, of two of those bills, the American Innovate Sorry, <laughs> but this one is always hard to say. The American Innovation and Online Choice Act, which I did not name, um, but I did work on, uh, and the Open App Markets Act. Um, and the, the bill sponsors are hoping for a vote this summer on, on both of those bills. And um, it, is, uh, it is certainly plausible that that could happen and those bills could become law. So tying back to the Biden administration, the, the White House has endorsed the, the big tech legislation. And um, that is that came from the DOJ in the form of a letter, um, which is not just uh, approved through the antitrust division, but also goes through other um, parts of the, uh, the administration. And then also um, at the Department of Commerce, Secretary Raimondo also endorsed the legislation so I think there's been a pretty um, uh, strong show of support there. This, as I think, as I mentioned, the, the legislation is bipartisan and has a lot of support on the Republican side as well. Um, just briefly on healthcare, um, there have been hearings on, um, I think that both in pharma and provider consolidation have been priorities on both the Senate and the House side. There has also been uh, legislation that has been advanced out of committee, but not um, enacted yet. Um, and I'd say another another topic that, not surprisingly, uh, has has received a lot of attention is the relationship between competition issues and some of the supply chain problems and fragility that we've seen, and also some of the. Um, the high, high prices, right? High prices in particular for consumer goods. Um, and I know on the House side, they had a hearing you know, looking at that. And um, you know, I think that's um, the sense, certainly from the White House, I think that you know there's messaging that certainly competition issues and consolidation issues and problems and lax enforcement over the years has um, under enforcement and lax enforcement has contributed to uh, many of the problems that we're seeing today in our, our supply chain and, uh, and very high and rising prices. Um, so for, for the other areas, you know, agriculture and labor, um, I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about labor competition issues um, later, but I, I would just also note that both, um, both of those have been explicitly identified as high priority for, um, for this administration, both again in that executive order and then by the, uh, the leaders of the, uh, you know, Chair Khan at the FTC and um, Assistant Attorney General Cantor at DOJ that both with rhetoric and action, um, I think we've, we've seen um, attention to, to all of the, the industries and, um, and issues that I mentioned. 
Thanks, Amanda. And Elise, you've done some research and you've got some interesting insights into kind of the current system and where we look like we're going. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jonathan, first of all, you know, thank you so much for having me too. Um, I think this is a really fun topic and I love a good excuse to see David and Amanda. Um, and, you know, as I've been saying, I think it's um, a really interesting time in the antitrust world. I think it's a really reflective period that we're in in a time where we're, we're really reassessing our assumptions about what it is antitrust law can achieve and what it should be aiming to achieve, right? There are a lot of um, potential goals out there and a lot of really important socio-political factors and considerations. And I think we are trying to figure out the extent to which antitrust properly has a role here. And I think one of the fundamental questions that's that you know implicitly raises is what is actually the capacity of antitrust law um, and policy to be achieving some of these goals. A lot of them, you know, are really worthy goals in their own rights. Um, you know, for any one given area of law, there's only so much you can maximize, right? Um, so you know, we kind of have to figure that out and also to figure out, you know, again, like what antitrust enforcement is actually capable of. So if we start bringing antitrust cases, are they, you know, able to really achieve the goals we want them to achieve? Um, so I think, you know, we'll get into a bit more of that uh, a bit later on in the discussion. But I think, again, it makes this a, a really good opportunity to be critically reviewing what antitrust law's capacity is and to be, you know, kind of checking our existing assumptions and, you know, taking a rigorous look at, okay, you know, what's the evidence that we have? You know, again, we've uh, you know, been enforcing the antitrust laws for well over 100 years at this point in the U.S. So there's a lot of information and data we can draw from when we're, you know, making these important decisions as to how to keep our markets competitive and how best to serve consumers going forward. Um, and I think as David alluded to in his discussions over at the FTC, I think we're seeing some, some similar themes in terms of, you know, some of these other notions that they're considering and how they might be able to affect some change and, you know, some good movement um, in some of these spaces. As, as David noted as well, I think, you know, we've started to see some initial shifts um, and the FTC, you know, expressing a lot of interest in some of these different areas, um, but not so much has yet had a chance to come to fruition again, you know, some of this change takes a little time and they've only had, you know, I think the, the new chair just passed the year mark. So I think they've, they've been busy. Right. Um, but not a ton again, has like been fully flushed out and started to come to realization, especially again, as, as David mentioned in terms of, um, you know, what cases have actually gotten to the courts and been able to be litigated. Um, so I think what we've seen so far is a lot of expressions kind of in, you know, policy statements, um, you know, sometimes in statements going along with settlements um, where the FTC is really explaining some of the other um, other things that like they are looking at critically now and I think trying to navigate the way forward on some of these. I know, um, you know, Chair Khan early on in her um, administration noted that she was really looking to create a more holistic approach to identifying harms, including recognizing that antitrust and consumer protection violations might harm workers and independent businesses as well as consumers. Um, so, you know, that's um, been a little bit of a, you know, shift in their thinking. I think we've seen a lot of focus on potential labor monopsony, um, you know, commissioner slaughter, I think last summer now, you know, reiterated that she thinks um, antitrust law can be doing more to affect racial equity um, and might be able to, you know, navigate in that space as well. Um, so we've seen a lot of kind of statements like that. And then the FTC also has been, you know, kind of changing or adopting some of their guidance. Um, so they revoked their Section 5 statement. They also withdrew from the vertical merger guidelines um, last year. And I think this, again, kind of puts us in an interesting space at this point where, They've taken away some 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 guidance. Um, they haven't put out anything new yet. I know they're actively working on it, and I think a lot of people have a lot of expectations about what that that might or might not be able to do. And as David said, I think we'll um, get into this a little bit later. Um, but I think it's again like a really interesting time, and it it does kind of feel like we're on the precipice of some potentially really big shifts, and are just kind of waiting to see how all of that takes shape. Thanks, Elise. Well, the first question we're going to throw to the, the whole panel is where would you put the Biden administration's efforts in the short and long term arcs of the history of U.S. antitrust and competition policy? So we'll take a couple minutes and talk about that, Elise, if you want to go first. 
Yeah, absolutely. So again, I think it's an interesting time because in a lot of ways it, it feels like deja vu all over again. Um, you know, for the last few decades, right, antitrust had been pretty focused on, um, you know, economic considerations, right? It really kind of became targeted over the last several years. And that's what the courts really look at is the consumer welfare. Um, and that's, you know, it's kind of the, the lodestar, right, of antitrust analysis when courts are figuring out, okay, is this does this violate the antitrust laws or not? They're looking to, okay, what, what actually happens to consumer welfare? Are prices going up or down? Is innovation, is this harming innovation? You know, is quality getting better or worse? And kind of really looking to those factors. And what we're seeing today is, you know, a bit of a resurgence and, you know, a, a notion that antitrust law maybe can be doing more about some of these sociopolitical goals that are, you know, again, a big part of the, the broader popular discussion at this point in time. Um, and, you know, really trying to foster that. And that is something, you know, in the history of antitrust law, you know, for several decades, there were many different goals that the antitrust laws were trying to foster. And I think, you know, recognizing some of the history is important here because it informs how we got to where we have been for the last several decades. Um, and so one thing in particular that I thought, you know, I, I'd mentioned in, in the discussion here is, you know, I've been working on a paper looking at uh, income inequality or the distribution of income um, because there's a ton of information there and kind of empirical work as to, you know, what's been going on for, you know, about a century now um, and kind of tracking that against what has been happening in antitrust enforcement. Because for a very long time now, there's been this notion that there's been kind of an intimate relation between antitrust enforcement and the distribution of income. So as far back as 1940, the Temporary National Economic Committee identified this potentially you know, intimate relationship between the two and you know, really set out to explore that given some you know, early data in terms of, you know, income inequality and what they were seeing in antitrust. And what I've been trying to do is kind of map the two trends over time to really, for the first time, explore what's actually going on there and see, you know, how well they, they track against one another. Because again, I think what's happening right now is like, you know, we're reassessing what antitrust law can do. And when we do that, you know, we really need to think about what is antitrust law's capacity here. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of agreement across the board that individual antitrust cases will have obvious distributional effects. And I think the bigger question is whether antitrust law can or really does play any sort of more than marginal role um, and can really affect change in terms of the distribution of income. And I, you know, think what the early data that I've been able to pull together so far doesn't really show that there's a, a strong relationship between the two that, you know, antitrust enforcement um, isn't necessarily, again, on a macro level affecting distribution of income, which, you know, is maybe not surprising given, you know, how factually based individual cases are and all of those kinds of things. Um, and again, like even the in 1940, the, the the report of the Temporary National Economic Committee noted that, you know, um, increasing the effectiveness of competition is not necessarily going to yield equal incomes for all. And that, you know, a considerable degree of income inequality, you know, seems consistent with a degree of competition and is probably actually an essential characteristic of a competitive economy, right? So again, I think it's it's kind of this balancing act. And, you know, I think that's what we're seeing again is, you know, we, antitrust law went from trying to foster several different goals, including many socio-political goals, kind of focused very narrowly on, on the economic goals for the last several decades. And now there's kind of, you know, this reassessment in terms of, okay, moving forward, are there other things antitrust law can or should be doing? Thanks, Elise. Amanda, do you have any thoughts on where we are in the long-term arc? Yeah, I do. Um, so um, I think I'm going to talk a, a little bit more kind of, um, I think the question that Elise raised and, and the work that she's doing is really interesting. And I agree 100% that it is very helpful to, to look to the past, to try to learn lessons from the past, um, to, in, you know, to make informed decisions about the future. So I really, um, for that reason, like I'm a big fan of merger retrospectives. <laughs> um, and um, so, so I really applaud her work on that. Um, I think it, it is a tough, um, it's a tough issue uh, in, in terms of kind of 
when you're looking at sort of correlation, I'm not saying anything that anybody doesn't know here, but correlation versus causation, and then sort of trying to isolate the amount to which, you know, how much antitrust enforcement or stronger antitrust enforcement might be um, somehow alleviating income inequality or other um, uh, socio-political problems. Um, my view is, you know, certainly under current law, we should be using every tool we have available to address socio-political problems. Um, we, uh, you know, we, so we have antitrust law and I think the, the rhetoric and the action that I think we've seen to date and probably we'll see more of is a reflection of uh, Assistant Attorney General Cantor and Chair Khan saying what, I, what I've heard them say all along, which is we absolutely need to be using every tool in our toolbox at the agencies to address um, the problems that we can. Um, so, uh, so I guess I say, I certainly, um, I do not think that antitrust can solve every problem, um, but I do think that aggressive and strong antitrust enforcement and more competition will, will help. And will help in a significant and, and tangible way that is that is worthwhile. I don't know that that act, that that affects, except for maybe at the margins in some very close cases, sort of which cases are brought versus which cases are not. Um, so I think it um, it will be interesting to see um, how the rhetoric and sort of the philosophy that Assistant Attorney General Cantor and Chair Khan came came into their roles with um, how that does come into play in the um, policy making and again like the enforcement decisions it's in, they're in, in enforcement agencies so how much will that actually change things um, I I again commend them and and um, think that they, they are on the right track to say we should be using every tool available to be um, as uh, you know enforcement minded as we can to try to address some of these problems. Um, and you know, coming from from where I came from, being on the Hill for those past three years, I think um, real like for for more significant change that we really do need to see um, legislative change and that we need Congress to step in. Um, but, um, you know, I look forward to seeing the enforcers and the agencies um, do, you know, implement some of the policies that they talked about and there's certainly a lot that they can do. Um, so I look forward to that. Uh, you know, I think one thing that I would like to highlight in terms of a change that, and I'll try to be brief about this, that um, that I think has been really positive and, and interesting um, that I did see sort of firsthand when I went back to the agency for a few months uh, after I was on detail is that I think Chair Khan um, and Assistant Attorney General uh, Cantor, but I'm sort of more intimately familiar with the FTC side, has made a concerted and, and, and pretty successful effort to democratize the agency's enforcement and policy work in a way that has brought in a lot of um, new and uh, important voices uh, that have somewhat, you know, perhaps because of resource constraints or, or other reasons have not been part of the conversation. So I, um, I think that has that has been a, a, a real change, and um, I think a, an improvement to have uh, not just kind of the narrow antitrust bar, antitrust lawyers and their clients weighing in on policy, but opening that up to more to the public and um, to community groups and small businesses and um, other types of um, civil society groups who can provide a very different but important perspective. Thanks, Amanda. David, what are your thoughts? Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to be brief, but I, I mean, I think 
at least rhetorically, right? Because we talked, we're still somewhat early. We haven't seen the full full fruits. But at least rhetorically, on the short term arc, I think we're seeing kind of the Biden administration enforcers um, again rhetorically reject a, a, a forty year bipartisan consensus around antitrust and and specifically kind of the consumer welfare and the role that the economics plays in that. <clears throat> and you know, there's kind of a high degree of skepticism of economic analysis and the idea of efficiency as an overriding goal of antitrust. You know, I think a lot of skepticism um, of, of corporate power and bigness in general. And, and, and to, be, to be fair and to be clear, this is not, um, say it's, it's a partisan rejection of it because you, you certainly see this from, um, from you know, there's, there seems to be a kind of a realignment happening you know, across, across both parties. You know, I see a lot of skepticism of kind of the value of, of mergers and, um, and, and acquisitions. Now, in the, in the broad arc, in the long-term arc, in many ways, this is a return to, uh, to older approaches to, to antitrust. Um, but, um, you know, one, one concern I have is um, sort of what, what replaces that consensus, because you know, I think there's some significant merit to the critiques that were, that were laid against kind of the antitrust of the, of the 50s, of the 60s, of the 70s, um, that, that, that it, was, it was vague and, and unprincipled. And so, um, and so I, I think what, what we haven't quite seen yet um, is assuming that the actions look to the rhetoric and assuming that their success is kind of what, what comes next. We have hints, you know, we talk about competitive process and market structure as opposed to consumer welfare, we kind of talk about dispersion of power or access to markets or kind of anti-concentration or even resiliency kind of in response to efficiency you know, hear a lot of talk about kind of the importance of bright line rules and structural presumptions and structural separations as opposed to a kind of a rule of reason analysis that sort of kind of specifically uh, looks at at, uh, at individual practices and and, and mergers. Um, but I think there's still a lot um, a lot of details that need to be filled in before we kind of understand exactly what you know what the new world will look like. Thanks, David. And kind of related to that, as you mentioned, there's been a lot of discussion about the consumer welfare standard and whether or not it is the, the kind of correct policy goal or whether there should be other policy goals. What are your reactions? We'll start with you, Amanda, to expanding antitrust purpose to things beyond kind of the pure consumer welfare standard that has been kind of the touchstone for the last three or four decades. So, um, so I think I touched on this a little bit before and um, that I... I think this is a good question and it, this is an area that I sort of welcome the opportunity to what I, I think is an area that um, merits some sort of clarification. Um, in my experience, people are often talking past each other when they debate whether antitrust law should be limited to the consumer welfare standard or, um, or broader. So I think it's really important to sort of start with a shared sense of defined terms um, and or, or you know at least for the specific conversation because it's just consumer welfare. I have uh, you know generally I've seen it be used in in two different ways, um, often without the the speaker maybe explaining that, um, but uh, just kind of assuming that everyone you know knows is is, is using the same definition. So. You know, first, I think there's a broader view, um, which is kind of prevalent among most members of the antitrust bar, and it's actually fairly conventional. Um, it was always my understanding of what I was supposed to be applying as a staff attorney looking at merger investigations, and that definition definitely encompasses non-price harms to consumers, um, like decreased quality. It encompasses harm to workers and sellers of goods or services, uh, for example, in monopsony cases. So, um, so that is that is one definition that I think is is at least among the antitrust bar and practitioners and the agencies actually not very controversial. Um, the uh, you know the other view that I think I've heard maybe more on the hill or um, maybe in academic circles is is 
um, more, more narrow, suggesting that the consumer welfare standard is only concerned with price effects on consumers. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, some, I, some court decisions have also kind of articulated it that way um, and uh, not been friendly or let's say have been even hostile to um, the, the broader view, which again, I think among antitrust bar is fairly con conventional. Um, so I, I think the, you know, and going back to the point about sort of what should the, what is the proper role of antitrust law? Um, I, I do think that consolidation and anti-competitive conduct has exacerbated and does exacerbate many social ills on a broad scale. So for example, hospital merger consolidation has, um, I don't have sort of the empirical work in front of me, but I think that there is, there, I mean, I know that there is empirical work that there has um, been uh, you know, harms to, uh, to patients and, and quality um, based on uh, consolidation. So, um, and, and access to healthcare and, and things like that. So um, I guess I'll, I'll just kind of wrap it up that, you know, in, in my view, stronger antitrust enforcement and policies that result in more competition can absolutely help alleviate some of these socio-political harms. And I, again, I'll say like, I don't think antitrust can solve every problem, but I do think it is an important tool in the toolbox and it, it shouldn't, you know, you should, you should take it out and use it. Thanks, Amanda. David, what are your thoughts on this? So, I mean, I'll say, first of all, I, I agree with, with Amanda that I think at least within the interest bar, consumer welfare has been understood to incorporate, you know, fairly broad. It goes well beyond um, on, on price harms. You know, the kind of the econometricization of antitrust enforcement, you know, and price is a very easy thing to measure. I think often channels litigation and disputes into, into price and, and price effects. I mean, you know, and that's obviously an important part of competition. Um, but I, but I agree that, that uh, anyone who's saying that it's just about price and price effects or just prices on end consumers as opposed to other people kind of in that vertical chain um, are, you know, are, are, are misstating it. You know, I'll be brief because uh, I know we're, we're running short on time, but I think, you know, vagueness historically has been a problem with the antitrust laws. In, in uh, 1937, Robert Jackson, who went on to be Justice Jackson, but he was actually the head of the antitrust division at that point in time, he said, for 40 years, administrations have alternated between the policy of being aggressively vague and passively vague when it came to antitrust enforcement. And, and Justice Stewart said in 1966, so about 30 years later, um, in his dissent in, in, in Vaughn's uh, grocery, that he said, the sole consistency that I can find in litigation under Section 7 uh, is that the government always wins. And so the consumer welfare standard and sort of the primacy that that has taken in antitrust analysis, which, which coincides with about 10 years after um, Vaughn's grocery, was really a way of supplying a kind of coherent, principled method to answer tough questions. And, and I'll just give you one example that, that Einer Elhog had in a, in a relatively recent sort of popular piece, where he said, you know, if, um, if you have a merger, if there's a 10 firm market and, and two of those firms merge, so it takes a different 10 to nine, but the, the merged firm is a more efficient and better competitor with the remaining eight firms in the market, you know, is that, a, is that a decrease in competition because it's one fewer competitors or is that an increase in competition because uh, it, it supplies more vigorous competition? And, and the consumer welfare standard is a way to answer that question and say, well, that's actually, that's not a decrease. That's not a lessening of competition. That's not something that we should prohibit under the interest laws. That's, uh, that's pro-competitive. That, that makes the market better and more efficient. And, and I, you know, I, I'm really worried if we kind of wholesale reject consumer welfare, um, that that we lose that coherence and we lose you know, we lose that that principled approach and I, I have many more things that I could say on this but in the interest of time I'll I'll stop there. David, I'm going to turn to you quickly and just ask. I know you were just at DOJ in the antitrust division and some of the senior leadership, and just talk for a minute about some of the challenges that the Biden DOJ is going to face in achieving their policy agenda. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think there's there's several. I think the first is just kind of institutional inertia. 
you know, running a federal agency is challenging under, under any circumstance um, and trying to make changes, even changes of the margins is difficult. It's like steering a battleship. Um, and, and that's just human nature. And if you, again, if you kind of take the rhetoric from, you know, from Chair Khan and from AAG Cantor seriously, and I think you should, um, then keeping with nautical imagery, what they're trying to do is not to have a just court, 10 degrees port, um, but, but to really kind of fundamentally change the, the, the direction of the, of the ship. And, um, and that's just a very challenging thing to do. Um, you know, there's also then resource constraints. Um, you know, I mentioned how this was a very muscular rhetoric about not, uh, not settling cases, but, but litigating them. Well, it takes a lot of effort to, to staff cases just for investigation. It takes even more to, to litigate them. And so you start running into the problems. You could only, you know, there's only so many cases that the FTC, the interest division, can litigate at any one point in time. Um, and so you really do have to make kind of tough choices on the margins. In every case, you choose to litigate rather than accept a settlement, even if the settlement isn't ideal. That's taking away resources from another case that you know that might that might be more more challenging. Um, and then I think the final sort of challenge is going to be the federal judiciary um, because you have forty years of of case law that embodies a certain view of, of antitrust. And um, you know the Biden administration uh, sort of enforcers are very critical of that view. But at least for agency driven change, and we'll set kind of congressional changes aside for agency driven change you can't fundamentally make those changes without persuading um, a, a federal judge and, and federal courts and doing that while you as the agency bear the, the, the burden of proof. Um, and so, you know, I, I, we'll see, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's uh, you know, a lot of intelligent, talented people over there. And so I, I certainly wouldn't, um, wouldn't rule that out, but it's going to be, it's going to be tough. Thanks, David. Elise, talk a little bit about the challenges the FTC is going to be facing. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, a lot of the same ones that, that David mentioned, again, institutional inertia is, is a very real thing, right? It's, you know, a big agency has been doing what it's been doing for a long time. And that's always going to be, you know, difficult when you've got a lot of different uh, motivating factors and different folks with different perspectives at the agencies. Um, one thing in particular I wanted to add on, kind of picking up on the point about the, the federal judiciary, um, is, you know, when the FTC and DOJ are thinking about, you know, how they're going to craft the new merger guidelines and what those are going to look like, I think there's a lot of pressure on the chair and on AAG Cantor, right, to really be reshaping merger enforcement. Um, but at the same time, what has made the merger guidelines so effective and so persuasive in court is that they've stayed relatively the same and that FTC and DOJ have been very clear that these guidelines have been reflecting their long-term practices, right? They've largely been retrospective as opposed to, you know, looking forward. So they've been telling the courts, this is what we've been doing for a long time. This is what we're seeing and have very thought out reasons as to, okay, for the last several years, we've been seeing this and this is how we've been updating, you know, for example, consent decrees, what we look for in divestitures. And so, you know, then over time, incorporating those changes to, again, like really reflect current agency practice. And I think there's going to be a bit of a tension for them moving forward in terms of, you know, if they want to start reshaping mergers um, and how they're reviewing them, how they kind of walk that line with also, you know, maintaining merger guidelines that, you know, courts are going to be comfortable relying on and giving deference to. I just add um, just real quick, Jonathan, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that um, I think that is a really interesting point, and I will be um, you know interested to see how courts do what kind of deference they do give to any new guidelines um, that are issued by the agency or or other guidance documents. I I do think that there is a a, a big uh, benefit to the, the agency being transparent about the fact that, look, we are new leadership here. We're gonna be doing things differently. So it, well, I know there's been some criticism about rescinding the guidelines and, and sort of, and there's, you know, there is a risk that, that new guidelines won't have sort of the force of law that the longstanding guidelines that have been in place have generally enjoyed by the courts. 
there is um, there's a transparency there that is providing, I think, a valuable information to industry and um, you know, marketplace participants who are considering mergers that, look, this is, that's the old approach. <laughs> like, we are not taking that approach anymore. And, you know, I, I give the, you know, the agency credit for that. I think it's important that people, that, that the guidelines match the approach that the agency is going to take. Thanks, Amanda. So one interesting question that I've had in thinking about this topic is assume that we have had the standards wrong and that the new kind of assume that we have had some sort of change in paradigm, which good, bad or indifferent. If we realize that there are mergers that we've approved and there are organizations and companies that exist now that maybe we don't think are benefiting consumers or how, whoever ought to be benefited, what is the way that you deal with kind of unwinding those things or how do you kind of control Z the situation and not basically just reward all the incumbent companies that have managed to get by in the old system and now you're punishing the future mergers uh, that are coming forward. So at least do you want to take that question first? Um, sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, and I'm sure Amanda and David will have many things to add and many corrections to make. Um, but I think it's a great question. I think that's really where the rub is today, right? Is, okay, but how do we navigate a viable path forward. And I think some of that, again, kind of starts with taking stock of, you know, what we've seen, not just in the short term, but, you know, the longer term trajectory of antitrust law and really, you know, looking at the cases and what the agencies have been bringing and how we've been doing things. And again, making sure that we're assessing what antitrust capacity is. Um, again, you know, we want to make sure we're using all the tools in our toolkit, but we also want to make sure we're properly identifying them and using them the way that we're supposed to. So that again, we're we're actually getting what we want to out of the tools and we're not, you know, creating chaos where we're trying to create, you know, competition. Um, and I think, you know, kind of to your point about how do we, you know, not just, you know, how do we, you know, viably on the way forward, you know, continue to help out, you know, smaller businesses and things. I think some of this is difficult because a lot of times with increasing regulatory costs and regulatory hurdles, what you see is like, you know, powerful incumbents are a little bit better, you know, maybe a lot better situated to be navigating that because they have all these sorts of resources. Um, so again, I think it's really important to be cognizant of both, you know, the effects we want to achieve and any potentially unintended effects of the different regulations so that we're not you know, pricing smaller competitors out of the market because we're raising the cost of, you know, all mergers, even ones that would be good for smaller competitors. And so that leaves us with only, you know, larger mergers with incumbents who are powerful and like have, you know, money to throw at lawyers to be, you know, moving things, um, moving things forward. Um, I'll let, I know, you know, again, we're, we're kind of, this, this hour is flying by and we're kind of getting close to the end. So I want to make sure David and Amanda have a chance to weigh in here as well. Yeah, go ahead, David. I mean, um, you know, one tool they have, and it's it's a hard tool to use, but if you want to unwind deals, um, I mean, you can you can bring Section Two or even Section Seven cases um, after after the fact. Um, there's nothing that um, that stops. Maybe if there's a consent decree, that'd be a different story. But if the deal just went through, and that's exactly what um, you know what what the FTC is doing with their large you know, Section Two case that came in in December of. Um, of 2020 is trying to unwind kind of long, you know, long since closed deals. It, the longer it goes, the more challenging it is because it's an equitable remedy. And um, at some point, I think federal courts say, well, you know, this happened 10 years ago, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna just give you that remedy now. Um, you know, I think on like a, on a going forward basis, you know, you could, you could imagine sort of, it probably has to be legislative, but you could imagine tweaks where you, um, you know, if, if a company, you know, met certain criteria, maybe of size in a given market, um, you know, maybe maybe kind of flip the the, the presumption um, or the or the you know the burden the burden of proof, and so that might solve you know by not creating shackles on smaller companies that kind of need to get up to scale to compete, um, but but you know but letting larger companies that might already have say fifty percent market share, making it a lot harder for them to kind of acquire companies that go. You know, above that 50% market share, but still giving them an out if there actually is a compelling sort of pro-competitive reason for the deal, but putting the burden the burden on them to 
to, to do that. I mean, this is this is a, a thought experiment in my mind. I'm not endorsing that just so we're, just so we're clear. Um, but um, I think those are those are kind of options. Well, and Amanda's on the plaintiff side now in her private practice, so she might want to want to endorse that position. Amanda, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think. Um you know, not just among among the plaintiffs bar, um, you know, to you say, um, and in terms of merger cases, there are actually very few private antitrust and enforcement um, challenges to mergers, even though that is, um, you know, that is contemplated within the statute. Um, I think that um, burden shifting is, is something that there's a lot of, well, at least on the Judiciary Committee, I saw, you know, there is, um, some bipartisan support for that um, in our digital markets investigation. That was one of the recommendations that that we included in the the report, and that was also in the third way report, which um, was authored by um, or put out by ranking member Buck and um, joined by a few other Republican judiciary members. Um, so I think that is uh, something that could be a good path forward um, in terms of legislation. Uh, with respect to kind of increasing costs for um, some firms, you know, if, if you sort of raise the cost of doing mergers, Calera, which was the um, antitrust reform bill, <clears throat> excuse me, introduced by Senator Klobuchar, that actually, I think, has different standards for sort of larger merger, mergers. Um, and so that, you know, that's one way to address it is you have kind of tailored um, standards based on the, the size of the merger. Um, one thing that I found, and then I guess just real quick on the on the House side, and there's a Senate companion for a merger bill that would be focused specifically on the, the covered platforms and kind of like the big tech companies, which is where there's been a lot of criticism about where the agencies have gotten it wrong. Um, I think just, just something that's interesting is the, you, when on the one hand, there's often, um, they say, there's kind of this messaging that we need, should have, we shouldn't have sort of some broad, big merger bill that adds a lot of cost to doing mergers. Um, but then I, I often see when we put forward kind of a tailored, um, more specific, narrowly targeted um, merger bill, the, the other side, or there's a lot of critiques that come out and say, oh, that's not right. We can't have one rule for, for one group of merging parties. And then um, you know, another for others. And often I, I think that criticism is just hard to take because it somehow it, it, it's not, um, it almost seems like these people are just saying, we don't want any changes. We don't want any merger reform, um, whether, and if it's specific, the critique is it's not general. We need an economy wide rules. And then if it's economy wide, it's, oh, it's economy wide. And, and there's something, you know, there's something wrong with that. So, um, that's just just to share some experience and what I saw. Thanks, Amanda. Well, we've got time to take one question that we received from the audience, and I'll just get take all of your thoughts on it. We had a question asking if we got rid of the consumer standard, would the set asides or goals for disadvantaged businesses from governments and from larger corporations be subject to scrutiny as economically discriminatory against small business competitors who are not disadvantaged? So I will. Take that. Um, we'll go start with Elise, um, and then Amanda, as the plaintiff's lawyer representative on the panel, we'll let you go next, and then David. Yeah, sorry. So I'm just trying to pull up that question again here. Um, so I think what I understood was, you know, if we're abandoning the consumer welfare standard um, for disadvantaged business. Oh, sorry. I think it's gone now. Um, so I guess, you know, yeah, like some of that I think is part of what David was alluding to in terms of, you know, how do we navigate a path forward if we're abandoning the consumer welfare standard and, you know, what does the world look like and how do the decision makers, be it, you know, the courts or the agencies, um, define or decide what's legal and what's not. I think, you know, today, one of the, you know, axiomatic things within antitrust law, right, is that, you know, it's there to protect consumers, not competitors. Um, and so what happens to competitors, you know, is certainly something the courts consider. But, you know, when you think about competition, 
you know, a firm can do something and compete successfully on the merits, that means a, com- a competitor loses out. So they're losing sales. So if you're just looking at what happens to competitors, that's not necessarily a good proxy for competition because, you know, consumers might be better off with the lower prices. And if, you know, a less efficient pet competitor can't, you know, keep up with that, that's, you know, it's good for consumers. It's not good for that competitor. And I think that's in a lot of the earlier case law within antitrust we saw was kind of the struggle, right? It was, you know, of course, we're looking at what happened to competitors and trying to protect small competitors that often put them at odds with what was happening to consumers. And so you see in some older case law, you know, the courts acknowledging that, you know, while we're going to protect these smaller competitors and prices might be higher as a result, but, you know, that's that's the line they were comfortable taking at that time. That's not really a line that the courts are comfortable taking today or have been, you know, over the last several years several decades at this point, during which, as, as David noted again, you know, we had a bipartisan consensus around the consumer welfare standard. So again, I think you, you know, you'd end up seeing a lot of confusion again moving forward. Amanda. So, yeah, so so I don't think, I, I don't, I just, I don't think there is this stark choice between we either, you know, that we're going to abandon the consumer welfare standard and the sky is going to fall and no one's going to know who can merge and who can't merge and what's legal and what's illegal. Um, you know, first of all, the, the agencies can't do that unilaterally. As David mentioned earlier, they have to prove to a court that a merger is illegal or that um, conduct is illegal under you know, the Sherman Act. Um, wh- what I take it is, what I see is I think Chair Khan and um, Assistant Attorney General Cantor are saying, is not like, I guess, and I think Turkan has even used these words, it's about a more holistic view of what are the effects of the merger. Um, And I think there is a lot of consensus that the bar has been too high to prove that a merger is illegal and that the courts have been reluctant to um, recognize harms that are real. And so that is why you do have a lot of consensus in Congress right now that something is very wrong and very broken with the way that we have been doing things. Um, And why there is, you know, Senator Lee, Mike Lee has an antitrust reform bill. Um, So you're just seeing it, you know, from all sides that um, certainly on the Hill, that that something is wrong here. And yes, we've been doing it this way for the past, you know, 30 to 40 years. Um, but we don't like where we are. So, so we've been doing something wrong. So we have to, not we have to, but we want to, from a policy perspective as, as Congress, we want to change that, what, what we're doing here. And we want to give courts, you know, new directions sort of a course correction. Now that can be, you know, that can be a big course correction, or that can be more, um, you know, smaller, um, and kind of be that more holistic view versus some type of, um, uh, you know, throw the baby out with the bath water kind of thing. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. No, that, that. Yeah. David, I'll give you the last word. Sure. So, I mean, I, mean, I think I, I echo a lot of, of what Elise said, which is I think there's real danger um, of kind of what comes next. Although I take, I take Amanda's point that, um, you know, that's not something that can be unilaterally done by the agencies and maybe it will be you know, an incremental change and kind of adding, you know, adding some some holistic kind of expansion of, although I think kind of the rule of reason approach is pretty holistic. So, so I'm not really sure how we do that without a change. On, to get like very doctrinal to the, this question was asked is whether set asides for disadvantaged businesses by governments would be subject to scrutiny. And the answer is no, absolutely not because the interest laws don't apply to governments, and that's that's a very well established doctrine. Um, on terms of large corporations, yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting thought experiment, um, and you know maybe we'll be litigating that in uh, in, in ten to fifteen years from now. So we'll uh, we'll find out. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you all so much, and panelists, really appreciate your time. Thank you to the Federalist Society for hosting this event. I know that we didn't get to everyone's questions, and we didn't get to all the questions that we, as the moderator and panelists, had hoped to get to, but this just gives us more things to talk about in the future. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, and I'll reiterate your thanks to the rest of the panelists as well. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to today's virtual event. You can check out our website, fedtalk.org, or follow us on all the major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date. 
with that, we are adjourned.